Okay, very good, very good. Okay, so probably you also noticed that I'm actually lying down in my armchair. Uh, this is because uh, four weeks ago I got a new knee uh, prosthesis, and I still need to have my my leg a bit high. So I'm indeed lying down. Okay, so yeah, indeed. So I want to tell you about intuitionistic mathematics. I imagine you also see my point. Let's have it like that. Yeah, so here we'll talk, I mean, at least half of the presentation will be about this intuitionistic mathematics. Mm -hmm. But let me start, uh, and maybe also let me just start by telling you what is the main message, I mean, uh, take home message is that one. Real numbers are not really real. Of course, I explained that. Uh, but let me start with motivations. So also, Carlos said, I'm a physicist. I worked, uh, still work mostly in quantum physics, from foundation to applications, uh, broad spectrum. Everything is quite fascinating here. Um, and so my motivation is about time, or more precisely time in physics, or the passage of time. And uh, of course, passage of time, like the concept of numbers, covers everything from physics to philosophy, biology, geology, mathematics, and so on. Even mathematics, we'll see that there is time in mathematics. Um, but of course, also the kind of answers that I'm looking after and uh, that physicists would be interested is not so much uh, a philosophical uh, description of the feeling of the passage of time. It should be something that can be used to make predictions, to make physics, to develop physical models of reality. So it has to be kind of concrete and uh, kind of mathematical. But anyway, if we start with the idea that we all feel the passage of time, uh, we can also turn to art. And so here is, for instance, one painting, which I, I like quite a lot, and which I think is a good description of the passage of time. Probably most of us, and certainly most of my physics colleagues, would not consider that as a description or an illustration of the passage of time. They would have a clock or something like that, or a periodic event, maybe with waves. But I think here we see more that there is really something happening, something that is ongoing, that is developing, and where surprises exist. So let me just continue with this uh, introduction. So what is time? Of course, no one knows. But uh, as uh, San Augustine famously uh, wrote, if nobody asks me, I know. But if I were deserve, deserves to explain it to one who would ask me, plainly, I do not know. OK, doesn't help too much. Um, a physicist would probably say that time is what ideal clocks measure. OK, that's almost a tautology, because what is an ideal clock? An ideal clock is something that measures time. So of course, time is what is measured by an ideal clock. Um, but what is a, a clock? Well, if you ask, again, an artist, you will have something like here on the right-hand side. So these kind of clocks, which are probably closer to our feeling, or at least to my feeling, of the passage of time. That doesn't mean that clocks these kind of good clocks uh, don't show something which is also time-like. Uh, maybe a good way of uh, naming this kind of uh, time is uh, Parmenides or geometric time, when what matters is being. And indeed, I mean, time in physics is this parameter T that you find in Newton's equation, of classical mechanics, or also that you find in a Schrodinger equation for quantum dynamics, or is also this geometrical uh, uh, characteristic of space-time that you find in, uh, in relativity, both special and general relativity. But so this is a kind of time which certainly makes sense and is relevant to physics. But as you have already written here, I don't think this is ex exhausting time. Um, and I think that an essential aspect of time is that there is a time before and a time after an event. For instance, a time before and after I made an important decision. 
this idea of before and after events, decisions, something that happens, and especially something that is surprising, something that is kind of new, something that was not foreseen or was not necessary. And then we really have the feeling that something has happened and that time has passed between before and after these on non-necessary events. So here maybe I like to really uh, emphasize that for me, deterministic creation is not real creation because whatever novelty arises is really just an unfolding of what came before. I'll, I'll certainly come back to that uh, and explain more about that. And I guess a better, ah, yeah, then, okay, instead of creation, we could also say events, deterministic events are not real events, so are certainly not new events. They were already there if they are deterministic. So a better illustration of the passage of time is, I believe, with this kind of sand clocks. You may say that sand clock is essentially the same as this kind of more modern clock, except that the more modern clock is much more accurate. But on the long term, there's also some diffusion, some irreversibility and dissipation in all these clocks. But here it is on a time scale that we can really uh, apprehend. So if we think of two of these grain uh, sand grains here on the top or near the top, which one is going to be the first to pass here to the lower part? Well, my physicist colleagues would say, oh, that's all determined by the initial condition and by the dynamical laws. But you don't need to think like that. Anyway, there's no way of really uh, predicting which sand grain is going to pass first. So there could be also some really creative uh, events here. And it's really the accumulation of all these little events, one sand clock, a sand, uh, a sand grain passing uh, first and, and so on. So a second concept of time is the accumulation of little events. And if these events are not necessary, are not deterministic, then I would call that Heraclitus creative time. When what matters is change. So certainly this, uh, this different concept of time, different from determinism is also uh, relevant, is probably closer to our feelings and is so far not really central in physics, but that's maybe something which is missing. So why I am so much interested in time as a physicist? Let's go back to what is actually physics and what do physicists do? Well, physicists produce models of reality and obviously these models should be as faithful as possible. Now, what does faithful mean? Well, first of all, it should give correct empirical predictions. And maybe many physicists would stop here, but I think this is only half of what a good physical model of reality should do. Another aspect of a good physical model is that it would allow us humans to tell stories about how nature does it. So a typical example is a, is a physical model of the tides uh, and the story then goes, there is the moon somewhere and the moon attracts the water and that leads to the tides. Uh, so in these kind of stories, you don't have equations, but you have time, the moon is there and then it attracts the, the water. And without this timing, you don't have really stories. So there's no way to tell a story without the passage of time. As Yuval Dolev, a philosopher in Jerusalem wrote, uh, to think of an event is to think of something in time. So to tell stories, we need time. And maybe I could here paraphrase Rabelais and say that Science without time is but ruin of intelligibility. So here is another illustration of the, the, the importance of time. And here my colleagues, physicists would agree that there is a tension, to see the least, between, let's say, relativity, uh, in which everything is fixed since ever and forever, with this block universe view, where the now is completely arbitrary, 
while we all know that the now plays a very special, special role in our lives. And on the other side here, you have, which is more my speciality, so a quantum uh, uh, here, a quantum uh, random number generator where you have a light source that produces photons that hit a beam splitter, which are followed, which is followed by two detectors, so two single photon detectors, and one we label zero, the other one we label one, and then we get a string of random bits. And here these random bits, according to quantum mechanics, could go on with bell inequalities, but I don't want to do all that, but there is really new information that gets created as time passes. So here we have new information. Here everything is fixed. So of course, there is a tension. And since uh, I was also introduced as a practical uh, applied physicist or an engineer, let me just show you how far with IDQ, this company that was mentioned, engineers have been able to put all that into a millimeter size uh, chip which is actually integrated in this uh, smartphone. Okay, in this case, it's a Samsung smartphone. And um, so some people actually, mostly in Asia so far, have, a, smart, uh, have a, a random number generator in their pocket, which are not, oh, it's maybe not super fundamental, but somehow makes it uh, more real in some sense. Maybe not the deepest sense, but certainly quantum mechanics makes new information, very concrete. And here is what happens if you stick to the left side here, this block universe, which many physicists do. So here is something that uh, uh, Sabine uh, uh, Hosenfelder uh, did in, in one of her YouTube. She also has a very nice book and many of her YouTube uh, videos are, are super nice, but this one, uh, I find shocking and I want to tell you uh, why. So in this video, Sabine says, you are here to hear what science says. Oh, very good. The entire story of the universe was already determined at the Big Bang. We are just watching it playing out. And she even goes on, we know the future is determined by the present. If you think otherwise, you are denying scientific evidence. Wow, that's very strong. So I'm probably, according to Sabine, denying scientific evidence. Uh, so according to this view, this block universe view, everything is like on this bobbin, a bobbin uh, from, a, from a movie. And the bobbin is already there since the Big Bang, let's say, since ever. And all what we're doing is watching it. It's like when you go to the movie. And if you go to the movie, you are a spectator. And indeed, if the movie is bad, then time passes slowly. If the movie is good, time passes much faster, as we all know. The problem is, if you apply this kind of, of uh, 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 analogy, uh, not to a movie, but to the entire universe, the entire universe, then there are no spectator. We are inside the universe. We are inside the bobbin. We are like the character on this bobbin. So the reality is that there are no spectator for whom the time passes. There are only the characters on the bobbin. And for these characters, no time passes. Everything is there since ever and forever. So you see that when you conclude that time is just an illusion, of course, free will also, and so on. So it has huge implications. Is that really necessary? So here I'll come now to intuitionist mathematics, and we try to give you first a very first encounter. So this is mathematics. How can time enter mathematics? So numbers, mathematics maybe starts at least with arithmetic, and you have numbers. And um, numbers are there to count. So how can it be that most of these numbers, and most of them are real numbers, the real numbers for those who would know is these numbers where you have a dot, and after the dot you have digits, and actually you have an endless series of digits. 
And most of these numbers are actually not computable. Let's try to define some very simple integer. Actually, it would even be just bits, zero or ones. Let me start with the following one, n1. And by definition, n1 is equal to zero if every even integer between four and 10,000 is the sum of two prime numbers and n1 equal one otherwise. So most likely most of you don't know the value of n1, but certainly also most of you have no difficulty understanding that n1 has a value n1 has a determined value. And probably many of you could just go to your computer and just compute it. You just, you know, look one after the other, all these 10,000 numbers, actually half of them because only the even integers and check whether there are some of two primes that can be done on, on a very simple computer. That's fine. So we don't know it, but it can be found. Now N2 is very similar, but this time, I look between four and a huge number. So here, while no one is going to jump on his computer to compute the value of N2, because it would take more than your lifetime and it would be super boring, uh, so no interest. But still, everyone would understand that it's just a matter of running a pretty simple algorithm for a long time, a long but finite time. So there is an, a, a finite algorithm, which for sure, after a finite time, gives us the value of N2. Consequently, N2 has a value. The value of N2 is determined, even if we don't know it. Let's continue. One last one, N3. And now here it is for every integer large, larger than four, without an upper bound. And this actually, so n3 equals zero would be, uh, is equivalent to Goldbach, uh, Goldbach uh, conjecture, which is an old uh, conjecture in, uh, in arithmetics. Now here you see there's a big difference because even if you have a super powerful computer, they, that doesn't give you an algorithm which is going to determine the value of n3 in a finite time. You know, you, after a century, Maybe you still don't know the answer. And then, so does N3 have a value? Is the value of N3 determined? For sure, there is no known finite method to compute N3. But nevertheless, if you're a student in mathematics and have been selected to be allowed to study mathematics, then you know very well that in order not to fail an exam, you have to claim that N3 has a determined value because of the law of the excluded middle. You know, if it is not N3 equal zero, it has to be the other one. So it has to have a value. Well, here comes now intuitionist mathematics. If the exam is in intuitionist mathematics, then the student should answer that the value of N3 is indeterminate. So there's an additional possibility here, an indeterminate value. Can be zero, can be one, can be indeterminate. And consequently, the law of the excluded middle is not valid. And indeed in intuitionist mathematics, like in most uh, constructive mathematics, the law of the excluded middle is not valid. So this is already shocking, at least for, for, for most mathematicians. Um, and certainly for most physicists or people who just use mathematics without too, too much thinking. But it's not even the end here. There is something more. Of course, this Goldbach conjecture could someday be proven by some clever mathematician. And that means that someday the value of N3 may evolve. After this finding, N3 may have a value now. Either someone found a counterexample and N3 equal one or N3 equal zero is proven. And so the, the number, this is a number. And this number may evolve, may change its value over time. It may evolve from indeterminate to determinate. So you start think, feeling here that even in mathematics, at least in some form of mathematics, uh, time enters. 
So let's look at uh, this intuitionist uh, uh, viewpoint. So uh, here I start with a quote by uh, Karl Posse, again, a philosopher from uh, Jerusalem, who wrote, we humans have finite memories, finite attention span, and finite lives. So we can fully grasp only finitely many finite sized pieces of a compound thing. There is no infinite helicopter which would allow us to survey the entire terrain or to tell how things will look at the end of time. You know, we only see part of it. We are like ants walking on the floor. Or also what Eric Bishop, a famous uh, constructive mathematician wrote, the classicist wishes to describe God's mathematics. The constructivists to describe the mathematics of finite being, man's mathematics for short. Constructive mathematics does not postulate a pre-existing universe with objects lying around waiting to be collected and grouped into sets like shells on the beach. So not everything has, is pre-existing. Things are happening, get created as time passes very different view of mathematics. And Brouwer, Brouwer is really the father of intuitionistic mathematics. He has it like that. Nature simply has not yet fully determined all objects. What I'm going to do tomorrow is not yet fully determined. But also numbers are not yet fully determined. And this can be compared, of course, to the uncertainty principle used in quantum mechanics. So that's the essence of intuitionism. And maybe many of you start to get worried, but how could there be things, including mathematical objects, including numbers that are not fully determined? Maybe to calm you a bit and calm your worries, let me state that with intuitionist mathematics, you can compute and prove theorems. You can Okay, you, you do that not always in the same way as in classical mathematics. Maybe it's not always the same theorems. I will show you some examples of theorems that get slightly changed or that are a bit different or even new. Uh, and also sometimes the proof technique may be different. But for sure, everything one can do on a classical computer and everything that, that we can predict in physics or in science, in bi biology, geology, you can always do it on a classical computer. And everything you can do on a classical computer can also be done with intuitionist mathematics. And all of physics, and here I could have written all of science, can be done. And there's an example which I like very much, climate physics. Of course, this is super timely. And how do the climate physicists do? We have a finite, huge but finite computers, and ideally, they should put as initial condition the, the temperature, pressure, and so on everywhere on the globe. Of course, that would be too much, so they cannot put all that into their, their computers. So they use truncated numbers. And then they let the computer simulate future climate. But at some point, because the evolution of climate is uh, chaotic, they need more numbers. How do they do that? They add stochastic reminders. So they create new digits. So just to be able to continue the computation so that they can predict the climate in, in, a, in decades or 100 years. Uh, here you have a paper by uh, Tim Palmer on that. Uh, how can I get rid of this thing here? Okay. So the mathematical language we speak, whether it is, for instance, classical mathematics or intuitionistic mathematics, has a huge influence on the worldview that physics presents to us. And the dependence of intuitionism on time is essential. So statements can become provable in the course of time and therefore might become intuitionistically valid while not having been so before, as you can find in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. 
And so Brouwer, so the father of intuitionism, he introduced into his mathematics the concept of an ideal mathematician. Sometimes he named it the creating subject, you know, the one who would solve this Goldbach conjecture, for instance, who continuously produced new information by solving mathematical conjectures. So Brouwer was a kind of idealist or even maybe a, a solipsist. So not at all a physicist. Physicist, a kind of naive uh, realist. And the way I will present intuitionism will be without this ideal mathematician, and I mo will motivate it by the physical concept of indeterminism or the passage of time. So it is very plausible that Brouwer would not have liked my presentation because I'm just a physicist and uh, okay, different, certainly a very different uh, worldview. And my main claim is that intuitionist mathematics is the natural mathematical tool to describe the passage of time. So first of all, that one can describe the passage of time and describe indeterminism in physics, and that intuitionism is the appropriate tool. In some, some sort, some way, it's like derivative, which is certainly the natural tool to describe velocities. We need mathematical tools for velocities. We need mathematical tools for indeterminism and for the passage of time. Let me come to an example, a classical example of uh, a chaotic system. So it's a classical dynamical system and most classical dynamical systems are chaotic uh, of the form of this example. So here the, the state space is just a number between zero and one. And in one time step, you do the following. You first stretch it. That's why it is called the Baker map. You kind of stretch your stretch it, and then you fold it back. And this is described by this little equation. But more uh, easier is to write this x, which is labeling here the state, uh, which because it's a number between 0 and 1, it starts with a 0 when you have a dot. And then you have a series, and let's write it in bits, so in binary format. So these are not digits, but are bits, are just zero and ones. And now this, this transformation, which I showed you here, is just the following. The first bit drops out because of this folding. The second bit becomes the first one. The third bit becomes the second one, and so on. You just shift everything by one uh, place to the left. And then obviously, whether x lies on the left or, or right half after n steps depends on the nth initial bit. Yeah, because after uh, the, the, the nth bit, b, uh, bn, b index n, after n steps becomes the first one. And the, the first one decides or determines whether x lies on the left or on the right. And you can now interpret that this is the probability of rain. So being larger than one half means it's mostly rainy, smaller is mostly sunny. And then comes the central question. Um, is the millionth bit physically real or physically relevant? Let me really emphasize, my question is not whether this billion for millionth bit can be measured. Of course, it cannot be measured. We don't have any uh, instrument to measure with such a precision. But is it physically real? Is this initial condition really there? And does it really determine the entire future? As okay, Sabine and many uh, would say, or is it actually non-real? Does it re it's maybe created as time passes as you start to uh, understand. Okay. So let's look at typical real numbers, understand what typical real numbers are according to classical mathematics. So actually probably none of you has ever met a typical real number because all the numbers that you have met are Maybe just a fraction, maybe even an integer, or maybe a screwed of two or pi. But all these numbers have a name. 
You've never met a number that has no name. Maybe the name is a bit complicated, but it has a name. The name maybe is actually an algorithm, finite algorithm, like a finite thing. But actually most of the real numbers, the enormous vast majority, we have no names. We are not at all of that form. The bits of a typical real number have no structure. The bits are random, completely random, us random us quantum measurement outcomes. So actually, the best way to think of a typical real number is to have a random number generator. And you look what comes out of this random number generator. And this is a typical real number. And indeed, since there are only countably many names and algorithms, typical real numbers have to contain infinite Shannon information. And the fact that an, a single real number contains infinite uh, information has been okay, noticed by many people, but uh, Emil Borel has uh, uh, illustrated that in the following nice way. With one real number, one can code the answers to all questions one can formulate in any human language. Of course, there are infinitely many questions, there are very many human languages. So to code the information to this infinite list of questions, you need to be able to code infinite information. And you can do that in a single real number. So you should now start feeling that these real numbers are maybe not that real. And according to uh, Grégory uh, Chatin, uh, the only good way of thinking of a typical real number is the unlimited string of outcomes of a true random number generator. <coughs> so this is not only one possibility to think of a typical real number, it's actually the only possibility. And when, for instance, physicists say, let x0 be a real number, denoting an initial condition, what we are effectively saying that is let x0 denote an infinite amount of information. And indeed, if everything is coded in the initial condition, everything is quite a lot, no? It's the entire future, infinite time. So you have to code infinite information. So it's a huge assumption to say that everything is in the initial condition. So actually mathematical real numbers are not physically real if you don't believe in infinity. Mathematical real numbers are actually physically random. And these random numbers, which would be a much better terminology instead of real numbers. Now we speak about real numbers because of Descartes for historical reasons, but a much better terminology would be random numbers. And these random numbers should be the basis of scientific determinism. No, randomness is in tension or in contradiction with determinism. Doesn't work here. So how should we think of uh, these random numbers or these real numbers? Maybe this is the intuition that we could have. You know, the first digits, they are well determined. But if you go down the series, at some point, these digits get less and less determined. They get blurred. And after some time, after some uh, position in this uh, series of digits, they get completely indeterminate. So once you have that, you may say, OK, but they are indeterminate, but I can supplement it. I can add additional information. I can add supplementary variables. This is something that people do, for instance, in, in quantum physics quite a lot. Quantum physics is indeterministic. Let's try to add additional variables, supplementary variables, that often come under the name of hidden variables or hidden local variables and so on. So we could just say that instead of God playing dice when potentialities become actual, God played all dice at the initial time and coded all the infinite results in the initial condition. That is certainly a logical possibility 
at least if you accept this infinite information. And so we face a choice. Either the fact that at present certain things happen and others do not is interpreted as revealing retroactively information about long past initial conditions, or else we understand the present as the result of indeterminate reality and the future is open. So here it's very important. So it's not that I'm saying that one is correct and the other one is wrong. I'm just telling there, are, there is a choice. Of course, now if you say, I don't want infinity, then you have no choice any longer. But if you accept also classical mathematics, then you have a choice. But for sure, the choice is not forced on you. You have the choice to believe in deterministic, uh, in determinism and classical mathematics or not. And for instance, if you now go back to classical mechanics, which is usually presented as a typical example of a deterministic theory, but actually the real numbers that we are using in classical uh, mathematics, or classical uh, mechanics, sorry, these real numbers, they are the hidden variable of classical mechanics. And you don't need to buy them. You can just go with intuitionistic mathematics. Now, there is a fact that almost all physicists accept real numbers without even noticing that they are supplementary variables while simultaneously rejecting Boomian positions. So Boomian positions are, is an example of hidden variables uh, that turn quantum mechanics deterministic. But here in both whether classical or quantum mechanics, you have a choice. So whether classical mechanics is deterministic or not is not a scientific question. It depends on the physical significance one associates with mathematical real numbers. So it depends on the mathematical language. And intuitionism indeed brings classical closer to quantum. Usually my colleagues like to bring quantum closer to classical. I'm doing just precisely the opposite. Okay, there were big debates about quantum, relativity, time, and all that. Uh, these two encounters are pretty well known. This one is a bit less well known. On the left, you have David Hilbert, which I use here to illustrate classical mathematics, in which every real number is an individual completed entity. All digits, all these infinite digits are given at once. And the continuum is a collection of individual points. And so you can pick out one of them, one real numbers. So these real numbers, they somehow exist outside of time in some ideal platonistic world. On the opposite side here, you have Brouwer, who I have already introduced, the father of intuitionism, uh, for whom real numbers are processes that develop in time. The digits are not all given at once, except the computable number, except the numbers that have a name or have a finite algorithm. And so the continuum is a viscous collection of processes. So I'll come back and I'll tell you what I mean here by viscous collection. Um, important here is there is also a continuum. It's not that here things get discretized. Uh, there is also a complete continuum, but the continuum in intuitionistic mathematics is very different from the, in classical mathematics. And in intuitionistic mathematics, time is essential at any instance only finite information exists. So let's look at this intuitionist mathematics. Let me give a brief uh, presentation of it. So let's start and, uh, with what Brouwer called choice sequences, alpha of n. n is an integer, one, two, three, four, and so on. And for every integer, we have a choice, an element of that choice sequence. Now the choices are made according to Brouwer by this ideal mathematician that I don't want. I want to have something more objective. So I just assume that nature has the power to produce true randomness. So to produce new information. And if we want to have a description of the passage of time, we need indeed to assume that nature has to, the power to produce 
new information. So I call that this natural random process and this natural random process indeed produces new information in the forms of bits. So at each time instant, uh, time step, which I call an instant, labeled by an, uh, an integer, the natural random process outputs some random number, some random bit actually here. Let's, let's think of bits here. And all these bits can be used uh, as argument of a computable function in such a way that we produce the next element of the choice sequence. So the choice sequence at instant n is a function of all the information that exists at that time. But of course, the information when we go to the next time step is going to increase. And so you can have that is the value of this function changes. I'll come to examples. Let me actually jump to examples. Then there is something about convergence. So let's start with the most simple example of an intuitionist number. So you have just this uh, random bit produced at instant n, and you use it as the next bit in your series. So actually it is bn, the next bit is just r of n. So this is exactly what I had with my illustration before with my quantum random number generator. Here it doesn't have to be quantum, it's just nature's power to produce new information. So these numbers are growing and gets more and more, but they are random. I call them even totally random because every bit here is random. Now the opposite example, maybe at the opposite extreme would be a computable number. For computable number, you can also formalize that in the same way, but you would say that here, all what is needed is a finite amount of information. It only goes up to K and K is just a fixed uh, integer. And so you only use finite information. And with this finite information, you can compute any computable number. For instance, you can compute pi, we come to that, or any pseudo random series like your computers, they all have pseudo random number generators. They use only finite information, obviously. So let's illustrate that with pi, which is probably the best known computable number. And all bits of these, of all computable numbers, in particular of pi, are fully determined by a finite deterministic algorithm. And it takes time to run the algorithm, but this is like my number n2. You, you know that if you want to compute one of these bits, it's going to take time, but it's only going to take a finite time. You have an algorithm, you can run it, may take some time, but you get it at the end. For sure you get it. Now what is even, uh, okay, more interesting here is that the bits, for instance, of pi, they may look random, like also the bits of your pseudo random number generator in your computers. They look random, but they're actually hidden in the algorithm and in the seed. So the, uh, and there's an example for pi, for instance, this algorithm here allows one to compute directly the nth hexadecimal and hence also the, the bits of pi without first computing the previous bits. And this is something very surprising. And I think very important to understand. Let's start with an, an example. For instance, assume that uh, whether it's going to rain at Piccadilly Circus in precisely one year from now is indeterminate. It's indeterminate, no way to know today. But of course, you can just wait a year. In a year time, it will be determinate. You just see, is it raining or not? But in order to know whether it's going to rain, you have to wait a year. You cannot jump ahead. But with computable numbers, in particular with pi, if you want to know the nth hexadecimal, you can compute it straight without the need of computing first all the previous ones, all the previous bits. So the bits of pi don't come one after the other. It's not one day after the other. Here, the bits, they are already all there because I can jump ahead and directly compute it. Let's continue with another example, which I think is important for intuitionistic number, which uh, we developed together. We, we call it finite information quantities, and we developed that with uh, 
uh, Flavio Del Santo, my co-author in this uh, PRA um, publication. So here the next bit, see it's the next bit, is not just given by the uh, last uh, random bit produced by the natural random process. Uh, it is a majority vote over the last K ones. And because you do some majority votes, you will get some correlations between the bits. The bits will be not completely independent of each other. You know, if the majority is very large, then the next bit cannot overrule that majority. So it will have some correlations. And so this is probably pretty close to the kind of numbers one would imagine in physics where you have first some bits which are fully determined if we are at time n. Then after qn, bits n, you have bits which are already biased maybe because of this majority up to the n plus k minus one. And then after that, well, these ones are still totally undetermined or indeterminate. Okay, uh, one last example of an intuitionist number is the following, which is quite a, an amusing example. So this is a number, you see this uh, choice sequence oscillates around one half, can be one half plus or minus, depending whether Rn is zero or one, whether this bit is zero or one. So it oscillates around one half, uh, but it converges to one half. But we add as a rule that this choice sequence goes on until by chance the last half random bits all happen to have the same value. Okay, so maybe at some point the series terminate or the number dies, as I like to say, and then it sticks to the last value. So you have something that oscillates above, below, above, below one half, but maybe at some point it's stops, it dies above or it stops below, or because the probability <clears throat> of termination decreases exponentially, there is an a priori probability that the sequence goes on forever. So here you see already that this number, you cannot say it is smaller than one half, at least as long as it didn't die. You cannot say it is larger than one half. You cannot say it is equal to one half. It is very close to one half, but it is kind of sticky, sticky around one half. Okay, this is another example, which I jump. Um, okay, you, go, you have also logic. Uh, for instance, the statement R of n is equal to zero is indeterminate before the nth time step. Like the weather in a year time is as today indeterminate and will remain indeterminate until a year from now. The proposition this mortal number is smaller than one half is indeterminate as long as the mortal number did not die. Okay. And so we have, already said it's so in intuition is mathematics, the law of the excluded middle is not valid. And so no non-constructive existence proof exists. If you want to prove something in this intuitionist mathematics, you have to make a constructive proof. It's not enough to prove the negation of something to prove that it is correct. It's not enough to prove uh, uh, that the negation is impossible because that would not prove uh, what you want to prove. It could still be uh, indeterminate. This is very surprising. It is at least surprising to mathematicians and physicists. And it is surprising to us because we have been trained and selected to accept the law of the excluded middle. If we would not accept the law of the excluded middle, we would have failed our exams at university and probably not be here. But again, if you think of an indeterministic world, a world in which time passes, a world in which the future is open, it makes a lot of sense that things about the future in particular are not yet settled.
So elements of this uh, intuitionistic continuum are evolving sequences of computable numbers. And sometimes the, uh, the sequence is still ongoing. So important here, let me again emphasize that there is a continuum in intuitionist mathematics. It's not that we discretize things, but indeed at every time step, there is finite information, but this finite information is growing. Or if you want this grid of the discretization is becoming thinner and thinner and thinner. Of course, if you have an, also some dynamics, especially chaotic dynamics, then these dynamics will stretch your, your uh, phase space. And then there comes one surprising theorem, which is called Brouwer's theorem, which says the following. All total functions, so all functions defined everywhere, are continuous. There are no step functions. Why is that? Well, let's suppose you, have, you would like to define a function which is zero up to one half and one after one half. What would be the value at one half? How would you uh, put this uh, mortal number uh, what, what is the value of that mortal number that continuously oscillates between smaller and larger than one half? It has no value. It's impossible to put a, a, a value there. And that's why step functions are impossible in intuitionistic mathematics. And that's what is meant by saying the intuitionistic continuum is viscous because you cannot really take out just one point and say, okay, all this one half, I take it out and consider it special. That's the point of discontinuity. It is a bit like honey. If you have a pot of honey, you cannot take out just one molecule of honey. Honey is sticky or viscous and similar here. Okay. Um, there are other theorems that have to be changed or adapted. Maybe let, let me just say something about Gleason's theorem because it's a very important theorem in, um, in quantum mechanics. And it was uh, noticed quite early that the standard proof of Gleason's theorem provided by Gleason himself is not valid intuitionistically. And that's raised when a, a debate. And this debate was then solved uh, by uh, Richman who proved Gleason's theorem, but in a different using a different proof technique. So some theorems are new, like that one. Some theorems are no longer valid, like the in intermediate value theorem can be replaced by something which is good enough for all practical purposes. And some theorems remain, but require a different proof technique. Arithmetics, just to say, you can also do addition, uh, computer, uh, sinuses, and so on things like that. Let me maybe not go too much into the details here. So, but at the end, um, let me just again say that the, the language, mathematical language we use when speaking physics has a huge influence on the worldview that physics presents to us. With classical mathematics, we have determinism, we have no time or time is an illusion and so on. But now if we go to intuitionist mathematics and compare it with indeterministic physics. So for instance, if we believe that physics is indeterministic, it means that the past, present, and especially the future are not all given at once. Today, it is not, the future is open. And this translates in intuitionistic mathematics by the fact that digits of real numbers are not all given at once. Time passes, well, numbers are processes. Indeterminism, numbers contain finite information. The present is thick. You know, that's probably a, a, an intuition that I share with several colleagues. Um, the present cannot be just this set of measure zero. Set of measure zero has no real existence. And the present exists without beyond any doubts, maybe less doubt from the past and the future. And indeed, here in this mathematical language, the continuum is indeed viscous. So the present cannot just be picked out like that. The future is open, no law of the excluded middle. Becoming, of course, very important in, in deterministic physics, 
choice sequences, experiencing intuitionism. Okay, so here, so far so good. Let me, okay, quickly, I see that I'm going a bit over an hour, but give me maybe a couple of more minutes. If that's fine. If not, Carlo, you just jump in and tell me to shut up. No. No, no, just a, probably five minutes will be good enough. You know, what is the, the main argument that many of my colleagues are going to, to tell uh, is relativity. In relativity, uh, indeterminism is not uh, trivial to, uh, to incorporate. And there are even okay, some arguments that uh, relativity requires, implies determinism. So let me just argue here a bit about the relativity of indeterminism, which is again a paper co-authored by uh, Flavio uh, Del Santo. So let's assume that we have uh, some uh, proposition A, which is indeterminate or some bits here, so here. The bit A is indeterminate, which means that a proposition A equals zero has no true value. Then at some point in time, so vertically I have time, or this uh, common in, in this uh, quantum uh, in relativity pictures or drawing of space time, so horizontally is time, vertically, uh, no, sorry, horizontally is space, vertically is time. And so at some point there is an event me making a decision or let's say more physically just a quantum event that happens here and then after that of course the bit a now is determined and the proposition a equals zero may be true or may be false depending on the value of this bit a so here let me just really emphasize the difference between ontology and epistemology um, Ontologically, a determined uh, bit may be known or may be unknown. Something can exist, be determined without you knowing it. However, if it is ontologically indeterminate, then for sure you may not know it. Then for sure you don't know it. But there's only one possibility here that doesn't exist. And what I'm now going to talk is really about ontology. I'm not so much interested here today in epistemology. So here, when I say that A is indeterminate, I really, it's not a matter that I don't know it. It does not have a value. Okay, so now let's have a second uh, observer. So the first one I call Alice and the second one Bob, as is traditional uh, nowadays. Um, let's suppose they are at rest, at relative rest, so they don't move with respect to each other. Of course, for Bob here, it is absolutely clear that he would not know the value of A because he's outside of Alice's slide cone. But what else, what, what, what we are now postulating together with Flavio del Santo is that really also ontologically, the value of A outside his future light cone is indeterminate. So we really have the following picture. A gets determinate, has a determinate value, only in the future light cone. And everywhere else, it remains indeterminate. Okay, I don't go here into the details, but actually this very simple argument, which I think is super plausible and super natural in special relativity, actually rules out some of the, the main arguments by uh, Putnam and, uh, uh, I forgot now the name of the other guy, uh, who, who um, had an argument claiming that uh, relativity implies um, determinism, but here we prove that it doesn't. Um, and then you could even have that you have a, a random number generator on Ali's side, you also have one on Bob's side, so same story on Bob's side. Um, and then you can also ask where is a proposition about the relation between bit A and bit B, for instance, A equal B uh, determined. And this one will be determined only in the intersection of the two light cones, only here. And then you can do the same for even quantum. So here you do a quantum measurement along some direction, you get some results, plus one in this example. So you collapse the state, which was a, a singlet to that state. Similarly on Bob's side, 
So those who understand uh, quantum mechanics, this is all pretty trivial. But what I'm saying now, which is non-trivial, is that it's only in the intersection of the future light cones that the complete collapse happens. Consequently, there is no wave function of the universe, which is again a big change compared to traditional classical, classical mathematics-based um, quantum cosmology. Okay, let me come to the, to the conclusion. Okay, again, the mathematical language we speak when talking physics impacts our worldview. And maybe the most important conclusion is really this one. Some conclusions one is tempted to infer from physics, like determinism and the illusion of time, are actually inspired by the language, not by the facts. You can keep the facts, keep the same prediction, same predictive power, but change the language and your worldview is affected. As I said, classical real numbers are the hidden variable of classical mathematics, or classical mechanics, sorry. And classical mathematics, if you think of classical mathematics from the viewpoint of intuitionism, this really assumes a view from the end of time. Of course, at the end of time, whatever that exactly means, Everything has happened. So everything is determined. All the digits of all the numbers, all the events, everything has happened. But that's only at the end of time of God's eye view. So the law of the excluded middle holds only if one assumes a look from the end of time or a God's eye view. And then it's not surprising that with classical mathematics, we get a, a worldview where everything is settled because that looks at everything from the end of time, once everything is settled. Intuitionism brings classical closer to quantum and indeterminacy is relative. Okay, I'll stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. And obviously I'm ready for questions.